when we put on the architecture of land art little exhibition up at Melbourne University, my partner Susan gave me a bit of a hard time about calling architecture land art. And uh, I'm sure Rebecca probably might have some thoughts on that as well. Perhaps I should call it land architecture. <laughs> but uh, we'll, I'll persevere anyway. Okay. Um, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is talk, uh, just have a few pictures at first, just to remind, or re remind you of sort of the breadth of our work, particularly here in Melbourne, and then go into smaller projects and basically talk about small, small projects for the rest of the, rest of the night. And as Charles said, expanding it from the houses, the eight or nine houses that we've done over 20 odd years, to include particularly some more recent buildings. Uh, so Melbourne Museum was a competition that we won a few years ago. And I think it was an interesting project because it, it starts to talk about the, the way we think about things. And our proposal there was to talk about dissimilar twins, how do, you, how do you build a building next to a, an old building like the Royal Exhibition Buildings in a big, great big heritage garden, um, albeit we built it on the Bitumen car park, but uh, it was still in the gardens, and how do you, how do you um, make it work, which we, did by, which we did by pushing it down into the ground, so the IMAX theatre, for instance, goes 22 metres down into the ground in order that we could keep the scale of it down so the top of our building was of a comparable height to the, the Royal Exhibition Buildings, the scale of it, keeping it in, the main entrance on the same axis as the Royal Exhibition Buildings axis from this coming up from, this, up from the city. Um, the axis sort of stops about where the building is because it, then it splits in the Carlton Gardens to the north. It splits out to each corner so it, it comes up th up through the Royal Exhibition Building into this building and then comes out and sort of splits off. So we sort of saw this as the terminator of that axis but we put, so we put the front door on that alignment and then put the, put the, the big blades that came out to each side as um, sort of leading out and, and, and inv inviting you in from Nicholson Street or Rathdown Street on either, either side. The, the, the frame that it sits in we sort of saw as a representation of Hoddle's grid and then everything else that sat inside it was bits and pieces that were the Melbourne, that were Miss Melbourne. So it's, a, it's sort of a composition of a whole lot of bits and pieces formal on the exhibition, Royal Exhibition Building side and breaking down as it hits, hits the park. And in the park, it, it just has a simple wall around the, around the bottom of it and, this, and the big blade, which we then saw as a companion, a companion to the 19th century dome. So there was two, we each, we each had an opportunity to stick our hand up in the air and <laughs> remind you of where we were. The Windsor Hotel, we're still doing, it's still happening in theory. We <laughs> in theory, our current understanding is that they've stopped taking bookings from Christmas and that we'll be able to get on and build it. Um, but again, it was our thought with it was um, that this building at the back, which is right at the back of the site, we saw as a, as a sort of a, a, a calming, a building to calm down everything. In other words, to act as a backdrop and hide a lot of all the commercial buildings in the city, what was happening in the city, and just create, create in effect a curtain on the back um, with the building sitting in front of it. And that, so it, it's, it's, we, do try and, we do try and use ideas to sort of manipulate the way, the way things happen and what, what, gets, what gets offered. And then the, the, um, the, the little Burke Street building is, a, is another separate sort of entity in, a, in, in itself. This is, this is a, a competition that we won in Manchester in the United Kingdom for a courthouse and it's a 55 courts, civil justice centre. Um, and I think, what, again, the idea that we developed was that the courts service, the, court, the judges and things in the UK are still very conservative, very conservatively based. Um, and uh, for instance, 55 cars in the basement, um, six of them, had to be large car spaces for the, for the High Court judges because they drove Rolls Royces. <laughs> Basic definition of the brief. <laughs> Similarly, up on the top with the, the judges' retiring areas up, up at the top of the building, we did one single large dining room 
When the senior judges saw that, they said, no, it can't happen. There's got to be two dining rooms, senior judges, junior judges. We don't, we don't dine with the junior judges. So that then got played, that got played out in the, in the building itself because there's a hierarchy of courts that started with the, the large high courts and mercantile courts at the top of the building down to the bottom of the building, which were probate courts, which were the least, least significant courts. And what we did was we just took each level and said each level was county courts or family courts, high courts, probate courts, all the different courts, and stacked them on top of each other. And however, however many of the courts there were dictated how long the stick was. And so you ended up getting the building actually representing the, co the courts and how many there were and what type they were. Um, and it, so it, it, it became a, a very nice a very building we're very proud of. This is another building which we finished a year or so ago in Sydney, which is the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology at um, UTS in Sydney. Um, it's got, it's a perforated screen and the screen is a perforation of zeros and ones, which is the basic code of, of, uh, uh, of uh, the uh, technology, of information technology. And it, in fact, it reads, as you read, if you can read the code, it actually says, um, Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology, UTS Sydney, and repeats itself right down the, right down the building. So it, it, you'd never be able to tell, but it actually does say something. And the other little thing we did was in sort of um, reference to the, the uh, white pointers, we actually put some gills on the, on the building so that you could, some shark gills, so you could sort of look out and look up and down the street a little bit. And inside, it's, it's a great big crevasse that splits the building in half and runs all the way through the building. And you can cross it or go up and down or cross at different levels so that you don't have to take the lifts all the time. There's, there's little, little sit-out spaces through it all and, and, and so on. So that, that's just a sort of a, a little spread of a few buildings. But I go back to the beginning now, back to the time of the city square when we um, first won the city square we we decided it needed a piece of monumental sculpture in the square, something big, or well, something that was clearly noticeable because we wanted it not to be the space between the town hall and the cathedral, we wanted it to be something of itself. So we wanted a, an object, something in the, in the space that you knew of, that you recognised as the city square and not just the space between the two. So we, I did a big trip around the world and went to look at basically monumental art. Um, that included the early days of Storm King, which Charles mentioned, and a lot of the other places like that, and went and looked at what was happening. This is a, a Richard Serra piece of sculpture, but it was sort of the sort of thing that we were looking at. We ended up um, inviting three Australian artists to submit marquettes um, and choosing the Ron Robertson Swan one, which is the, the vault, the yellow thing. Um, <laughs> and it worked very well. I mean, it was very evident. <laughs> And, and it caused quite a lot of noise. Um, and I'm quite pleased that it's now outside the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art. It, but um, it became a start of an interest which also spread into an interest at the time when travelling around into lo at looking at um, the American land artists at the time, um, which included people like Michael Heitzer. And this is one uh, uh, outrageously big piece of land art where he's carved across the edge of a canyon across a, a branch into the canyon, this groove that goes in and then jumps across and out the other side. <coughs> and he, similarly, these pieces, um, which, are just, which are metal pinks cut into the, into the, into the ground. And I don't know if you've, anybody that's been to Deer, Deer Beacon in uh, New York State, um, there's just three absolutely, uh, absolutely fabulous pieces of Michael Heitz's work, which is three big, holes in the floor, massive holes in the floor that are black and just ha are infinite. One, one's a circle, one's a square, and I think the other's a triangle, I think they're the three. And they are just, so, they're frighteningly deep. You stand on the edge of them and they are, they're, they're absolutely amazing experience. Or Walter Di Maria's um, lightning field, in, which he did down in New Mexico, where he put a couple of hundred big stainless steel poles into the ground in an area which gets a lot of lightning. And then you go down, you sit there and you just watch and the lightning comes down and hits the hits the different um, poles. But we then, at much later than that, we started to get involved in 
sort of landscape urban design things and we got appointed to do the rede re redesign the um, South Bank in Brisbane. And in the South Bank in Brisbane there was this canal that ran through it that had boats that ran along it. And part of that problem was if you have boats running along it's a bit hard to have bridges over it. So it actually became a barrier that split the park in two. Um, so they decided they wanted to get rid of that and we, just, we decided to put in what we called a, an arbour. It's about 1.2 1 1 kilometres long and we wanted to cover it in bougainvillea. So you've got, you've got all the, the flowers and the bougainvillea and it, makes it, it meanders through the, through, the, uh, through the park. One thing you can never do is control the gardeners. So <laughs> we'd, we'd said that they were supposed to trim this just to, 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 the, to the trunk up each one so that you didn't see any greenery and then all the greenery was on top. But they've insisted that, it, no, they want the greenery down, right down to the ground. So it's, it's not exactly the way we planted it, but it, it, uh, it, it kind of is. And you, you, can, you can sort of see it wandering on th right through there. Something you would know um, was the gateway, Melbourne Gateway. Now, this came out of, there were two bidders for, the, for this bit of um, toll road, which was uh, Transurban and Chart Roads. And they'd both put their bids in to do it. And the government came back to them and said, that's all fine, guys, but you didn't do a gateway. We wanted something that showed the in coming into the city. So they came out of their meeting. They were given six weeks to come back with ur more urban design responses. They came out of the meeting. We got a phone call from Transurban and who asked us whether we'd do it. And we said yes. And then half an hour later, we got a phone call from Chart Roads. And <laughs> we, we said no, but kind of wondered who was going to win. <laughs> So it was a, what, it, what it is was an idea or a composition of ideas about gateways and city walls and things like that. So th there, was, there was sort of like picket fences or, or big walls. Um, <laughs> and and the, the big stick. So the big stick is surprisingly is four metres square, so it's m quite massive. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a staircase right up the middle of it, so you can, then go, right, you can go right up the middle of it to the end of, to the, end of the 70 metre cantilever. And it, it's quite, it's quite in interesting, but um, we, 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 we speculated about what was a contemporary gateway. And our idea was that a contemporary gateway is something like a boom gate in a car park these days. And that in, you know, in, the, in the boom gate, so this became the boom gate in its open position, meaning you were welcome, you were invited in. So it was, it was, it was playing with, uh, with uh, all those ideas about fences, walls, gateways and the like. Which goes to another gateway. This is, this is a gateway in China in a, in a, in a city down called Nanning, which is a subtropical city down in the south of China, um, where they wanted us to do, they wanted a gateway. And when you came off the toll road and turned, turned in, and this is, this is a photograph taken from where you'd be as you come out of the toll gates and about to drive up the, up the, up the road. It's about 800 metres from here to the top of the hill, and when you get to the top of the hill, you look over, the, you, it all opens up and Nanning just opens up in front of you as, as you, see the, you can see the whole city. So we were, looking, we were trying to think of something that was a bit dynamic because again, the Melbourne Gateway we saw as a dynamic thing. You, you, we design, were sort of designed to be experienced at 100 kilometres an hour. So it was big and simple and a series of, series of things that you just experienced at, you could experience at speed. And this was the same thing. We wanted something that you could experience at speed. So we created these two flowers. Um, but the difference being that whilst, whilst one, one was complete in itself, the other one in fact was an illusion. It actually, it actually ran up the hill. So I'll, I'll just get, go back. So the one on the right hand side not, is not that way at all. So, but, so it gave you something to experience as, as you drove up till you got to the top of the hill. It actually extended the experience and made it into a more interesting thing. Um, for better or for worse, like some of our other buildings, like the city square, 
none of these hills exist anymore. They've all been completely demolished, flattened, and full of high-rise towers. So our gateway didn't last all that long. Another one you'd recognise is Web Bridge, which was to create a bridge. There was the original Web Dock Railway Bridge, which used to come around here, and they demolished it back to about here. Then they wanted to turn it into a cycle and pedestrian and cycle bridge that brought you down to the water's edge. Now, when, when you calculate the difference in height and the length you need for a disabled access, you actually ended up having to get to achieve that length from there right around the outside of that curve down to there was the area that you needed. So it could have been a, a zigzag or something like that, but we felt it was far nicer to do this simple sort of curved shape that when you came across the bridge, there was a few little hoops and things along there, then it became more complex and, and contained as you went round and down the, down, the, down the curve. We did a bit of post-completion justification in that we realised it looked a little bit like a, a, an Aboriginal um, Eel, eel trap, but we didn't think of that first. <laughs> that, came, that came later. <laughs> it, uh, it does have that sense of being of being led into a, into, a, into sort of like into a trap in a way. So I'm going to talk about the houses that were in the exhibition, and start by talking about this, which is. Inter European interventions in the landscape. I think that was our idea sort of started. Um, that when you, when you come from, say, Sydney and you fly down and you come over the Great Divide and suddenly it starts to get cold, you suddenly get, really get all these windbreaks that, that, the, that the original settlers planted and built and put in to pr help give protection to the, the stock and to build, you know, give you protection where, where you build a house and all those sorts of things. And we first, I first saw it when uh, actually in a, um, in a in an awards presentation by Graham Gunn when he was talking about an airport that he did down in the um, design down in the um, Western District and he talked about he, he used the the, 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 the um, trees the windbreak trees as a reference for, for that design and it, it rather sort of stuck with me and when we came back to thinking about it we, we were thinking about when you're doing, when you're doing things like houses in the, in the country, um, how do you make them more than just a house? How do you make them into something which, is, which reads, reads as, a, as a sort of an intervention or a bit of land architecture perhaps? <laughs> so it started us thinking. The first one we did is um, Barry Marshall's house down at Phillip Island which is just sunk into the sand dunes. So it's just in the dunes. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the grass, and, grass and planting goes over the top of the house itself. And this is just a, and there's a garage underneath here. And it, but it's just, a, it's just a 30 metre square piece of, of managed grass within a, a sort of fairly wild landscape that you arrive and drive in, into here, park the car or whatever, and, and go into the, into the house. So it's down at a place called Kitty Miller Bay, um, which is just next to where the penguins are. It's about the next bay across from the penguins. Um, and it's just a black, black, all in black concrete. And it sort of sits very low and low and low and sort of, sort of ro it rolls down out of the dunes and down onto the, onto the, onto the ground. And the black concrete re sort of relates to the basalt that you see a, a, a lot of edges with the basalt. So that from inside the square, you've just got these concrete walls and then you can, you can sort of see through and see out to the, to the, uh, to the, to the water beyond. And there's obviously planting, you know, planting growing up back over the top of it now. And, but this was all, this sort of planting was just what came with the wind, came with the thing. It's just what's happened to grow. Um, it was just always just a bit of grass and that just gradually changed and extended. And then on the front side, the windows were varied according to what, whether it was a bedroom or a bathroom or different uses and so on. And uh, it just sort of just comes out, out, of, out of the side of the dune and just extends across and drops, drops down. 
So that was a 30 metre square enclosed and I'll, co I'll come back to that. The next house we did was at Cape Shank and uh, it was a smaller house, a smaller sort of beach house which looked out the other way out to the, uh, to the ocean, the other way or, or on the, e the, end, the end way. So it's like a tube, but it was a tube, that we, a tube that we twisted. So we twisted it by the slope of the roof so the, the Safit, the under, not, underside of the building and the roof were, the, were like, and, the, and it, it was a kinked, kinked over. Um, and you, you came up a fairly steep driveway up to here and then walked up the stairs and in and there was um, two, bedrooms and a, two bedrooms and a bathroom and a laundry along the bottom here. <coughs> then you kept going on up the stairs to the living area right through here and then master bedroom and bathroom and master bedroom on this end. So no windows on this side because we wanted to keep it simple but it also partly because it's in a golf course and if you're on the, if you're on the <laughs> tee down there, I don't know, is it a slice or a hook? I don't know, round, round, round to the right, they get golf balls bouncing off the building <laughs> from the bad, when you get bad golfers. But it, it looked out out to the southwesterlies, so the windows to the left here were very, were just a long sort of cinemascope of window that allowed you to look out but didn't open, whereas out to the, out to the north we could open up and create a, an enclosed sunny courtyard which was f sort of fully contained by the tea tree around it and we subsequently built a studio beyond which just ex extended that same, same tube f further on as a, as a studio space. Which brings me back to the 30 metre square. This is a sheep farm house that we built out north of Kyneton. Um, the owner owns about 6,000 acres, I think, all, all up. It's a big, very big property. Um, and he wanted a house and he wanted a, a guest house and he wanted a machine shed and a garage and he wanted a shearing shed and a ram's, a ram's shed and a, <laughs> all sorts of things. So we, we said, well, we'll contain it all with, with a wall. We'll, we'll build you a wall that protects you from the bad winds and we'll put everything, everything on the other side where you're, in protect, where you're protected. So he was, a, he was a managing director of a major contracting company here in Melbourne. Um, and so he was quite happy to build it in off form, build it in tilt slab. So the wall comes up, goes, goes round, goes behind that taller wall round out here and, and then off into the distance. But you come down, you come, you come down the hill into, into the same sort of 30 metre square but it's, only, but it's open on one side and it's just a, just a gravel entry space uh, with, with some olive trees so that the, the guest house is here behind this wall, the main house is here the garage and mach machinery sheds are here and then the other stuff all goes on out, out that way. But we built a taller set of panels which we, which we lent against this concrete wall and to create the sort of entry <coughs> to the house. And then the house just sat on the other side of it. Um, and we sort of referenced the sort of sticks as being things that were holding the roof down, stopping it blowing away because it's pretty miserable weather up there or can be. Another house that we did that's in this series was a house on a, on a vineyard called Medhurst. Um, if you know the Arrow Valley, you might know Colstrom Hills up here on this end here and Medhurst Road comes down here and you can come in in off there, round up, and eventually come back round to the house this way. Um, they, it's a big house, it, it's about seven or 800 square metres, so it's quite substantial in size. Um, on two levels, on the, on the ground level, we, oh, we, they said they wanted to be able to see over the hill and be able to see up, into the, up to Hillsville, up the valley to Hillsville. So we got a ladder out and climbed up and worked out where the floor had to be in order to be able to do that and lifted it up, which meant we had a whole floor underneath. And underneath we put in entry, 
we put in garage, ent entry, office, a couple of bedrooms and bathroom, and also a, a big cellar because he was formerly the CEO of Southcorp when Southcorp owned um, Penfolds and or what, what <coughs> Treasury Wine Estates transformed themselves from Southcorp. Um, so he had a pretty excellent cellar, so it was a great big cellar in the, in the bottom of it with many, 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 many magnums of Grange. <laughs> and we wanted to do just a very simple glass house that sat between two, two blades, the floor and the, and the roof, and sat on top of these cross walls. Um, and then closing down the back of the house to the, to the bush at the back, but looking out on all the other three sides. So that's, that's the house when you get there. So you've, you've come around and parked here, but come in the front door here and up the stairs to get upstairs. And uh, you can come out from the, this area here, out onto this terrace here from the, from the cellar and so on. But it just look, it's up now up high that you can see over this, this, this hill and see down into Hillsville. But we like, we like that sort of long, clean, long, clean line of the cantilevers and the cantilevered floor plate and, and the roof plate. So we leave the country, we actually, and I've just started to put in some other things, but to talk about, and this one is another pl pl house like this. It's a, it's a, a house with a big um, art collection, which is Anna Schwartz's collection. And this was a house that we've done in Carlton, um, in Canning Street, just near, the, just, near the, just near the Carlton Gardens. And this is the, this is the view of it from the back. It's, it's, there's, there's, only a, there's only a sort of a street front elevation and the view of the back where it opens out into a very nice big garden. It's a, it's a very simple house and primarily when you come in, the, 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 we, 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 the idea was to have these sort of zinc elements. So there's a, there's a zinc blade like that which lifts up from the floor and, and the street outside is a little bit lower and the big, the big glass garage door so they drive in and they can drive in and actually park under that sloping edge so the cars are in but you can still look out through the glass and out to see the, the, um, the square on the other side of, of Canning Street where they are and so on like that and you get light back into this very long space because the rest of the light really comes from the other end. But this is, this is basically Anna's gallery where she, where she has sort of pieces of her current pieces of more pieces of her current artists on display. Mm -hmm. But we put this big, big zinc wall right through, right through, the, right through the house that separated the main, the main spaces off from the entry, from the powder room, from the cellar, from the kitchen, from the, stair, the, the way upstairs, all those sorts of things are all behind this wall and there's a series of, of panels that just open up to go through to different parts of it. Um, and then to behind us it opens out into the, gar into the garden, but it's a very controlled space. Back to the country, another house. So this is a house also in the Yarra Valley. We've, we were looking at the previous house we were looking at is there over there on the hills over there on the other side of the valley and the, 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 the Yarra River is floating through the middle, through the middle here. Um, so this is a house on a vineyard and it's beautiful because it's, it's got the top of the hill. It, you actually get 360 degree views right around, right around the valley from that top of that hill. And the idea was just two simple forms. So there's a, a court end box that runs one way and there's a black aluminium box that runs the other way that just sits on top of it. And behind it, we built, we, built the, we built the back up to the height of the highest point of the land because we had, the council required us not to build on top of a hill, but to build below the edge of the top of the hill. <laughs> so we, we, we kind of did. But it does mean that if, if, you're, if you're in the guest room at the back of this box, this box here, looking out that way, you actually look over the top of that and can see right out, right out to the view. Um, so... It's a very, yes, yeah, a very simple box 
40, 42 metres long, 6 metres by 4 metres for the core 10 box, and about 21 metres <coughs> long and 3 metres by 4 metres for the upper box. And most of the windows, the smaller windows and things, bathrooms and things, are hidden behind perforated <coughs> sections of the thing. And in the middle here, this, this section is, is three doors that, that open out like that and allow you, allow you to sort of open out onto the front area of the house. So I think they sort of exhibit our ideas about, in a way, for, forcing in a way, but compelling the architecture to be to be strong, clear, simple sort of interventions where you actually, I don't think you, you compromise the, 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 the use of that, the, the, how the house works, but you actually do control it very much into being very simple things that, look for, that can look very strong when seen, when seen from a distance and, and have a sort of a power of their own. We won a competition to design the new visitor centre, exhibition and visitor centre at Stonehenge. And this was our first scheme, which was to bury it in the ground. This, they, had, they bought a site about 50 acres on the Avon River, so on, on the edge of on the River Avon, and meant, which meant that you're about three and a half kilometres from the actual stones themselves. And we did a scheme where the, the, the people arrive, the car park's here, and they arrive and they walk along the front and in and they go through all the exhibition space and all those sorts of things here. And then they stay underground and got into a, a road train and stayed underground under the road here and then they came up into the Salisbury Plains um, and, and then in, onto, onto um, on Stonehenge itself. So the, ex the experience of coming from the car park was to come along this, this way. You had the sort of the meadow down to the river on the right and this was a, a a galvanised steel wall that just ran along that edge and you, you, entered, you entered through the, the gap in the middle. But seen from, distance, from, seen, from down by the, seen from down by the river, it just becomes this long, not very high wall. Because the stones aren't that big when you go to Stonehenge, it's deceptive, but they're not that, not that large. So the highest stones are in fact only 7.4 metres high to the tallest, top of the tallest stones. So we, we, we made a proposition that the visitor centre should not be as high as the stones. In other words, you should start out lower so you, didn't, you, didn't, you weren't in some cathedral space or some sort of space where you then, the stones were diminished by. And then the other proposition we had was that it should, not, it should be nothing like the stones. The stones are probably a really early um, statement about architecture, in fact, about column and, column and beam, because they're all about uh, columns and, and beams on top and things like that. So we decided we'd stay away from that and just do something that was completely different. So you went, in, you went into something that was quite different. Now there's been recent visitor centres like the one, at, the one in, in England, um, I forget what you call it, where, where, where the big bluestone um, the Giant's Causeway, yeah. And the architects for that have actually done a building that looks like the Giant's Causeway. It's dark elements that repeat and all those sorts of things. And it, to us seeing it, I think we're more convinced that we took the right approach. I don't think that that necessarily works, is to try and reference or replicate what's there. It's better to be different and then get the, exp get the experience when you arrive. So that's certainly the, the, the proposition that we took. That, that project fell over because it was financed under a heritage lottery arrangement whereby it had to be built with, with, with the highways department building a tunnel alongside Stonehenge to, and out of the way. When the highways department worked out it was going to cost £900 million to build the tunnel, they, went, they got cold feet and the whole project fell over and went away for a couple of years. Then they had another competition, which fortunately we again, the second competition we won, um, but this time the site was inside the World Heritage Precinct. So once you get into the World Heritage Precinct, they are absolutely paranoid about their heritage crust, the ground, about not really touching the ground. So we, we, actually, we actually found a sort of a, a valley thing and we, by filling it with dirt, we were able to sit the building on the dirt 
and all the plumbing and everything else that was underneath, all that sort of thing, was in the fill and not, we didn't actually get into the, the, uh, the heritage crust at all and we were able to build it and it's seen therefore as temporary for a hundred years or whatever it might be, but sometime or other they may well want to dig it up and look for, look for something underneath. Very unlikely, but they wanted that option. Um, so different propositions, sitting in the World Heritage Precinct just over the hill from Stonehenge so you can walk to get there. So we looked at two, different, two other ideas and one was, one was a floating, very thin floating roof that, that followed the sort of the, the Salisbury Plains, the curves of the Salisbury Plains and, and un, held up by a whole lot of very fine sticks that weren't vertical but were all over, sort of all over the place. Um, and we saw so, and th th we saw that as sort of referencing the, the birch forests, which aren't too, which are around the area. So it, we were sort of putting those sort of references together, and then building two boxes: the glass box on this side, which was the cafe and the bookshop, and some some student, some teaching rooms and things like that. And on this side, a wooden box that was the exhibition space. And then you ca you came into a covered area with a with a um, ticket office in the middle of it. Again, we tried to stay with that same idea about keeping it low enough to sit, not to be higher than the, than the, than the stones themselves. And then this was the, the final product. You can, you can sort, of, sort of see the amount of fill that's gone in under here to build up this sort of valley to, to create the, to create the, the, the uh, site on which we built. So it's, the, the columns are very thin um, and they s start sort of on the edge of, these ver of this very thin edge of the roof and the roof just sort of floats, floats along. It's not always fine weather either. It's, yeah. <laughs> you frequently go to Stonehenge in fog, uh, but it does look rather nice in fog. Which brings me to Venice. Um, in the ni early 1980s, uh, they, they, they started the architecture biennales in Venice. It used to be just the art biennale every two years. Then in the beginning of the 80s, they started, started to do the architecture biennale on the alternate year. So at the beginning of the 80s, um, Aldo Rossi was commissioned to do a building for the biennale, which he did on a on, on a pontoon. It was called the Teatro del Mondo, the theatre of the world. I guess that's the translation. Um, and it was towed in and pulled up against St Mark's Square. When we did our competition for the Australian Pavilion in Venice, we thought that was a nice idea. Australia's such a long way away, a nice idea, the idea of something coming in. So we suggested it might come in on a barge. Now, <laughs> It didn't actually happen. We actually built thing on site, but this was a little throwaway, one of the little throwaways that we did in the competition. That it, but, this, but this idea of coming from a long way away um, and, and arriving and being, and all through it, the idea of it being new and different and being unexpected, um, enigmatic, which takes me this, with, which we thought of if you go to Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey, they were all living happily or happily jumping around and then suddenly this thing arrived, a big black thing and the world changed and we figured well that's what it's all about. Australia comes and the Biennale changes. <laughs> the, the Biennale changes. We also thought that it related to this, this very famous painting which is Malevich's Black Square that he did in 1915 which was just about a black square, basically. I mean, I'm sure there's some more philosophical things about it, but... Uh, and brings uh, around in a circle back to Richard Serra, who has sort of, in a way, gone from doing sculpture to doing what I'd call land art. And this is, this is his more recent piece in the Qatari Desert, um, called East West, I think it's called. But it's just an absolutely, uh, to me, it's an absolutely fabulous piece of, of work. Each piece incredibly thin. 
And I just, I just find it just such an exciting piece of, of work. So we had a black box. I'm not quite sure who that is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's Simon Mordaunt being grumpy. <laughs> Don't know. It was an interesting proposition. If you, if you know Venice, the main part of the Biennale, the, the Giardini, where all the pavilions are, is here, and this is, this is the end of it here. Um, you've got all the, all the big pavilions tended to be up and down this road coming up the hill. France, Great Britain, Canada, Germany, Russia, and so on down the, and down the hill on each side, Denmark and so on down the hill and then out that way and around. You know, there was a lot of it there and we were given the last, or Philip Cox was given the last site available in the gardens. And so he built it, what recently became called the temporary pavilion. I don't think he ever thought it was a temporary pavilion, but it became called the temporary pavilion on this site here. Um, the difference and w what you had was it, it, you had the garden on the other side, you had the canal, you had the bridge which could be seen from. But the, the Cox Pavilion for some reason had its entrance here, which meant you had to come down this little laneway down to here. This is where the rubbish was always being collected. It was slightly odd. And we'd always, I'd always thought it was odd when, when we came to Venice. In the competition, our first proposition was to flip the entry over. But it was interesting that of the, I don't know how many competitors there were in the competition, six or eight, nobody else did that. Everyone else left the entrance right here. But it seemed to be just an absolute no-brainer to shift the entrance, put it on this side where the entrance was next to the Euro, front door of the Uruguay Pavilion where you were coming through on a, a bigger pathway that led on down to the bridge. Much nicer space where you had an outdoor terrace here where you could sit around and look out across the gardens, watch the canal be seen from the, from the bridge and the, on this other side. It was a much more, much, much more social entry and much, much more part of, part of the activities of the Biennale. And I think, that's, I think to us it's worked very well. But it, it was a quite a key st strategy for us to do it. And so you get the black box. The black box, the doors shut, and when the doors are shut, it just looks like a black box. But when it's, when it's open, you get a series of things that open up. You get a, this one opens up to a window. Th this one here opens up to the main entrance. There's two of these, one here and one on the other side, that open out. And we finally, for the Tracy Moffat show, we got them to install the digital screens into those things so that she actually projected um, film through onto, on them. So it sort of became more complete. The the way in, well, I'm standing at, I'm standing here, this photo is taken from the front door of the Uruguay Pavilion. The way into our pavilion is up this um, walkway up onto this terrace, which looks out, it looks out over the gardens and you can sit out and talk and it's a really nice place to sort of hang around. And looking back, you've got this, this door which has gone, opened up and opens into the pavilion itself. The building's clad in black granite. We had wanted to use South Australian imperial black granite, but the, as best we can tell, the, 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 the quarries were, had been bought by Chinese and they were cutting it into 300 by 300 by 15 mil tiles to sell in the market. And they were not interested in supplying us with any stone. We asked, but they, nah, not really interested. So we ended up getting some black granite from Zimbabwe, um, which was almost identical to the Adelaide one. And it's a, the, the, it's a lovely stone. And we broke it each, so each of these panels is about, one me, about a metre square, roughly. So you get three panels, all tightly fitted, and then the bigger, the bigger tartan of joints in between them that sort of breaks the, the, the up and sort of sets where, the, sets where panels are that open and shut. They form one, one of those squares. So this is sort of the this is the sort of the view in. So you can see you can see the gardens opposite. You can see the canal. You've come in off that side into into a foyer and then into the main exhibition space beyond. 
and this is a, a window when, the, when it's open and, and a window, or if you want to, you can shut it. You can put a white panel in and it can just be a white wall as part of the gallery space. Which leads me to Sam. Um, we were fortunate recently to win the competition to design the new Shepherd and Art Museum, which is a, such a lovely, lovely job. Um, and our first idea was built around these big vertical plates. But the, the difference that we, uh, that what we created was we turned them out at the bottom to create verandas because we felt that the you know, veranda was a very rural sort of thing to do, to have a, you know, to have a veranda. People, you can sit with your back to the wall and look out, be covered, rather than bigger covered spaces, you actually sort of created veranda spaces. And that these were of different heights and of different materials. So they ranged from core tin to zinc, aluminium, and so on. And they, they contained the, 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 the gallery inside it and, and had, a, had a height to them. They had a height such that they stood out up above the the um, the red gum of the of the of the the flat land around Shepherd and um, and you, we were actually able and looking at actually getting people up to this height where they could la look where they could look out across the expanse, but also the height meant that it was a it was a visible a visible element when people came in from Melbourne along the main road from Melbourne and came into town, it, it sat there as, a, as, as quite a tall sort of signal when you've arrived in, into downtown Shepparton. So these blades just sort of just hang off the ground. Um, they have no apparent way of holding themselves up other than the building behind it. And these are just some images of the building, the front, the front entrance here. The view from out across the lagoon. Um, and you can see the differential heights and you can see the, the opportunity here for the, that top level of the, of, the, of the gallery to have, it's up there where there's a, a theatre, there's, there's a bar, there's, there's a commute, com, um, meeting space, you know, there's gathering space and things like that at the top. And you can you have the ability to look out over the, over the plains. And this one, this side here is lifted up the most because it creates, we've, we've created what we call the, the art hill, which is in fact, we're covering up all, the, a lot of the loading dock and stores and a lot of the back of house stuff is, is kept under that hill. And you can, want, you, can, you can wander up it to the cafe. And so the cafe is on the first floor and opens out onto the top of this top of this hill and then there's a little amphitheater little amphitheater in here and some public toilets and things like that around it and this gives you the sense of the of what goes on inside so you come in on the ground level and basically up into really sort of two floors of galleries mainly and then as you get up high, you get into other things like the collection storage and things, and these activity things up on the top. Um, there's some, uh, the, the, the building shares some space with, with an indigenous art gallery on this edge here, and with an information centre on the other corner. But they, it's strongly and boldly the, the, the art museum is really what you, really or what you know, see it as. And this, we suggested that there was the opportunity to then project onto that and use the hill as a place that people could come and, and sit around and think and in the evening you could, you could project onto it. So that's it.